So my name is Kenia Alcocer, um, an undocumented immigrant from Mexico. I arrived to the United States in 1990 um, and we lived in Watts. Right after the Watts riots, my mom decided to move us somewhere else. Um, I started doing a lot of um, organizing in high school, mostly around sex education. The high school I went to had high percentages of teen pregnancies. And then I started organizing around access to higher education, knowing that I was undocumented. I knew I wasn't going to be able to have access to it. So working with um, then assembly member Marco Antonio Fireball, we were able to pass AB 540, which gave access to higher education for undocumented students. At the same time that I was doing that organizing, my aunt who lived in the housing projects in Boa Heights, um, Pico Aliso, they were going through a process where they were going to demolish the projects and they were going to be evicted. And so that's where Unión de Vecinos was formed. And in 1996, my aunts started organizing against the demolition of the projects. Uh, by the time that their home was about to be um, demolished, it was like around early 2000s. And that's when I got introduced to Unión de Vecinos in the early 2000s. And in 2003, I started working for the organization, but organizing in the outskirts of um, the housing projects in Boa Heights. Um, while knocking on doors, we were talking to folks about the different issues that were happening in Boa Heights. Um, but folks felt that, how can we fix the environment, for example, if our air is contaminated, if they haven't fixed the pothole that's in their front yard, or in their streets, that's been there for 20 years. So we started doing a lot of community organizing around different issues. And then by 2005, a lot of our community members started talking about the issues that they were having in their homes. And that's how we started in getting involved in ensuring that um, folks were organizing around not just their block, because we were forming um, neighborhood committees, but we were also starting to organize buildings and tenants that had issues with either repairs or being harassed. And that's how Unión de Vecinos started organizing and essentially um, that's when we created in, within Unión de Vecinos our own tenants union. Um, later on, um, in 2015, while we were fighting against gentrification, a lot of um, nonprofits started coming into our neighborhood saying that they were going to build affordable housing. Uh, when the first affordable housing came up, we started noticing that none of the folks that needed that affordable housing were getting access to it. So we started questioning who was this housing for and what did they mean when they were saying affordable because it wasn't affordable for folks. Um, so at the time, in order for you to qualify for this housing, you had to be making 40, 40K a year. A lot of the members of our community in Boa Heights were making 30 or below, a lot of them 15, um, and they didn't qualify for this housing. And that is when um, a lot of foundations, because we were attacking some of these organizations that were saying that this was affordable housing, decided to withdraw their funding from Unión de Vecinos and kind of got um, a lot of um, backlash in that sense. Um, that's when we decided that we wanted to be a organization that was not tied to the nonprofit industrial complex and that was really committed and has always been committed to the community and that our struggle was always for the poorest of the poor. And that was where we're, we were gonna continue to fight from that front. Um, at that point, that is when we call on our allies and friends from all over the city to figure out a strategy of how to keep Union de Vecinos running in Boa Heights. But while we were having those conversations, interestingly enough, a lot of those folks were talking about the issues that they were having in their neighborhoods, a lot of the issues that they were having as tenants. And that is when we started um, talking about building the Los Angeles Tenants Union. Um, the Los Angeles Tenants Union, it's, a, it's been a space where tenants are the ones determining their future and determining what is their demands and their asks and what is the things that we're fighting against. Um, and at the very beginning, we understood that 
we were not just f fighting as tenants, we were fighting as full human beings, not just to live in a home that is habitable, that it's affordable, um, but to live in a neighborhood and in a city that really responded to the needs of the poor and dispossessed. I think that we've learned a lot from the 2008 housing crisis and we take a lot of information from that. I think that it is an incomplete fight if we're just talking um, about tenants in general. And we've been having these conversations um, a lot because during the 2008 crisis, a lot of our tenants had these corporate landlords. A lot of these tenants had these massive banks that started owning their property because they repossessed them from whoever was owning them at the time. Fighting back against those folks is very hard. And I think that that's what we've been learning through. Uh, we learned how to push back, how to make sure that the city was responding to tenants. So when now moving forward to 2020, when the pandemic hit, I think that a lot of our tenants had a lot of clarity that they weren't gonna put their livelihoods um, in danger for someone that had shelter, had food, had healthcare security, and that is their landlords. They didn't have any of that. So I think that the realization that we could not just say, we're gonna pay our rent, but not be able to buy food and not be able to have access to healthcare was a possibility for any of them. And I think that that has, that has risen the consciousness of a lot of tenants, not just in the city of LA, but across the country, when in 20, April 2020, 30% of the population across the board in the United States wasn't able to pay their rent. Um, all of them got laid, laid off. A lot of people had to shelter and couldn't get out. So I think COVID has given us the ability to really talk about what are the rents really mean and what does debt really mean? Because tenants are being forced to pay back this debt. But if you're a consumer of a credit card, you can always file for bankruptcy. Poor people are not given that option. So for us, the fight, I think it's a fight against rent um, debt right now. It is a fight against massive evictions. And it is a fight where we're changing like, the discourse of like, who are we, what are we paying rent for? Because all these landlords can't afford to survive. We can't. So for us, it's like a continuation of a fight of um, reclaiming our homes. Um, and here in the United States, it's, it's been a hard fight because constitutionally, we don't have rights to the land as people, as in other countries in Latin America, for example, where people can take over a land and then require their government to provide resources and to provide materials for them to build their own homes. Here in the United States, we don't have that. So I think for us, it's like a question of like, how are we gonna fight back to make sure that we're, we're making a lot of these um, housing, public housing, for example. How, do, how are we socializing the housing in a way that helps our communities to have sustainable homes? Um, and how do, how do we fight? And I think that one of the things that it's very important, and it's a huge component to this, is that we're no longer just talking about apartments or homes, we're also talking about our tents. Um, a lot of our folks lost their homes and had to build a tent at a park or a, at a certain corner. And now we have all these outhouse folks that are fighting to maintain um, their right to where they're living at. Um, a huge fight was Echo Park, for example. Um, the Echo Park folks organized during COVID, had an encampment that allowed them um, to be safe. And they were taking care of themselves. They, they were taking care of each other in ways that you go to shelters and they weren't doing so. So how do we continue to fight for the right to your, your roof, for the right to your home? whether that home is a mobile home, it's a tent, or it's an apartment, or it's, a, it's an actual house. We need to figure out ways in which we are determining what our home is and how we can protect it.
Well, I think the pandemic made it very clear. I mean, our tenants, when the pandemic hit, the first worry was we're not going to be able to pay our rent. Um, but after that, we ha started having conversations about we cannot pay our rent, but we can also afford food. We cannot, uh, we don't have access to health care. Um, the jobs in which we're working are at are forcing us to work without PPE. Uh, there was wage theft happening at the time too. Some folks had to go on strike. We had members that are also members of the Fight for 15 movement. And then we started realizing that our members are not only members of Union de Vecinos or LATU, they're also members of Fight for 15, um, Ground Game LA, because they provide mutual aid work. So one of the things that I think it was important for us is to realize that we need to be an organization that is fighting for everything and not just one thing, and that we need to make sure that we're connecting every single issue together because our communities don't live a single issue a day. I mean, they're not just immigrants one day, they're not just workers another day or tenants another day. They are facing harassment, whether it's at home by their landlords or whether it's at work by their um, employers or managers. So we need to make sure that we're fighting at every single front and that folks feel that they are protected in every single way. And it's not, I mean, your home obviously has to be the piece where you go to, but the outside world is also impacting that piece. And we need to make sure that they have a, a safe place, not just to go to, to run away from things, but that they can go to, to enjoy their children, to enjoy their lives. So for us, the People Summit it, uh, gives us the ability to look at our work, not just as local. Um, and when we talk about the Tenants Union, the Los Angeles Tenants Union has been able to influence um, other, other cities to join um, and build their own Tenants Union. So Inglewood, Glendale, Pasadena, the Los Angeles Tenants Union has fostered that care. Um, we're now part of Autune, which is the Autonomous Tenants un um, Union Networks. Um, and that is national and even international because there's folks in Canada. So one of the things that for us, this summit is important is for us to understand that the housing struggle, it's not a local struggle. It's not a California struggle. It's a national and international struggle. And we need to make sure that we are having discussions about how people are gonna have the abilities to be able to say or the right to housing, the right to clean water, the right, right to environmental justice is a right that it's guaranteed for every single person in this planet, the right to food. It's not something that it's, we're just seeking for the city of Los Angeles um, because it is very easy to lose things if you're the only community that it's fighting for. This is something that needs to be globalized. Um, and something that needs to be international in order for us to truly change um, the power dynamics of who owns the housing and who controls the housing.